This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number five, James chapter two, Prejudice and Genuine Faith. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman, and this is the uh, second uh, session on the book of James. The last time we met, we met and talked about James chapter 1 and focused on trial and what true religion was, as well as talking about trials are seen as a, an, an opportunity and that rig, religion was something that was supposed to be lived out. And they were the two main thrusts that we focused on on chapter 1. As we look at chapter 2 in James, um, we want to look at um, James 2, and we want to look at prejudice and genuine faith. Um, and this, this chapter can be broken out into two parts. On the one hand, it could be the acceptance of others, or perhaps we might say, uh, we might put it in, uh, in a negative way, uh, showing favoritism is wrong. And then the second uh, section would be looking at... Um, uh, um, faith and works, and what does that look like? Um, uh, faith cannot be proven without action. So we're going to begin by looking at um, the first part of this, uh, chapter 2, the first 13 verses. And we're going to look at the importance of, the, of, of accepting others. And so James begins in verse 1 with a, a negative command. We read, My brothers and sisters, do not show prejudice, or partiality is another way that might be translated, if you possess faith. Or, you might read it, do not have faith with personal prejudice, might be another way to, to translate, in our glorious uh, Lord Jesus, who is our Christ, who is our Messiah. So we see this uh, negative uh, uh, statement or this expectation that we aren't to discriminate. We aren't to be prejudiced. Um, and then he moves on to a, um, a uh, reason for if someone comes into your assembly, and I'm going to read down to verse 4 now, if someone comes into your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, and a poor person enters in filthy clothes, do not pay attention to the one finely dressed and say, you sit here in a good place. And do the poor person, and to the poor person, you stand over there, or sit at my feet. If so, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Um, there's, you know, this passage begins by with an exhortation, an expectation. And the expectation is we aren't to discriminate. Showing favoritism is discrimination. We are not to uh, show favoritism or be uh, partial uh, between people. Um, there is this uh, sense in verse 2 where it talks about, for if someone comes into your assembly, um, assembly, you know, we're talking about James writing to Jewish uh, folks, and so assembly here is a synagogue situation uh, to recognize and, you know, recognizing that God's word transcends time periods and cultures. For us, it would be if anyone comes into our church, um, we aren't to um, be prejudiced or show distinctions. Now, the form, of, uh, the form of James' question in the Greek in here, uh, when we read in um, verse 3, uh, is, uh, it's, it's said in a way that expects a, um, a positive answer. For if someone comes into your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, and a poor person enters in with filthy clothes, do you pay attention to the one finely dressed and say, you sit here 
in a good place and to the poor person, you stand over there or sit under my feet? He, that's a rhetorical question that he's expecting them to respond positively to. In other words, this was happening. This was a problem. You know, when we think about in our culture, uh, we, we do this in many, many ways. Uh, it could be a football player versus a nerd. Uh, it could be uh, someone who, who dress sharply versus someone who, um, who wears shabby clothes. Uh, it could look like uh, a person who is extremely powerful in the community and someone who, who isn't. It could be a politician versus a garbage collector. It could, be, uh, it could be a number, it could be a professor versus someone who um, is a plumber. By the way, both all those professions are noble. Playing to, but what happens is playing to powerful people in order to get somewhere um, is not viewed well in James. Um, but we see it all the time, don't we? Um, uh, <laughs> it, it happens in churches, it happens in Christian institutions. Um, and, and of course, you know, we need money. We need to raise money. We need to make sure that we pay the bills. But at what expense? According to James, uh, and quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, it happens today in our community, and it's wrong. And if we're doing it, it's wrong. Now, he moves into this uh, discussing this improper practice. Um, and he does it in a way that uh, focuses on a wrong assumption and then a true assumption. So let, let's work our way uh, and read verses 2 to 4 as he t talks about this hypothetical situation that, um, that uh, presents both a wrong assumption and a uh, true uh, assumption. Uh, and, and the fact that there's a, an inconsistency when it comes to favoritism. Verses 5 to 7 reads this way in this hypothetical situation. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, once again recognizing he's talking to Christian Jewish people. He's talking to Christians. Did, God, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he promised to those who loved him? But you have dishonored the poor. Are not the rich oppressing you and dragging you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the good name of the one you belong to? But if you, oh, uh, and I'm going to stop there. So he's asking these, these questions about um, the poor. And he does it with three questions. And he does it by first noting, saying that uh, God has chosen the poor of the world. Don't you know God's chosen the poor? Yes, yes, uh, we know that. Uh, and then he asks the question, don't... Uh, 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 are not the rich oppressing you and dragging you to courts? Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. And do not they, don't they blaspheme? The, yes, yes. These are rhetorical questions that the answer is expecting a positive response. And so there's an inconsistency in this showing of favoritism. It's a, it's a reality that's happening, happening, but They're treating people poorly, these rich people, these favored people. What's a Christian's duty? How should we respond? Um, as opposed to, to recognizing that favoritism dishonors God in verses 5 to 7, the author now, James, wants to talk about the implications of this and demonstrate that um, uh, what the Christian's duty is. Um, 
or what uh, what uh, what's the ramifications uh, uh, when we do this? Well, James tells us in verse eight. But if you fulfill the royal law as expressed in Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show prejudice, you are committing sin and convicted by the law as violators. So this act of showing favoritism, he, he comes down pretty hard on it. He's recognizing it's happening. He's recognizing how foolish it is because the very people you're trying to impress and show favoritism to are uh, not treating you well to begin with. So what are you expecting? And the bot, but moving beyond that, it's sin. It's sinful. It's wrong. It is not what is expected by God. For the one who obeys the whole law but fails in just one point, just this one point of showing favoritism, has become guilty of it all. He moves from this Christian duty to obey the law and not show favoritism because to show favoritism is sin. He moves to talking about the importance of uh, prejudice in verses 11 to 12. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a violator of the law. Speak and act as those who will be judged by a law that gives freedom. And so the illustration is, even though he's not focusing on uh, prejudice, but he's talking about two other sins that are recognized. You do the one, you're still guilty of the whole law, breaking the whole law. The prejudice fits into that same mode. And so he moves into saying it's really important that we as believers do not show favoritism in verses uh, 8 um, through 11. So now he's going to move to what are the implications. What are the implications of our own judgment? What are the implications um, to um, showing favoritism? Um, We read in verse 12, speak and act as those who will be judged by a law that gives freedom. For judgment is merciless for the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. So here we have a principle applied uh, at this point. Um, so speak and so act as people who are going to be held accountable. As we speak, as we act, we do so knowing that we are accountable for what we say, for what we do. The law is considered a, a liberty. Um, there is freedom in Christ. We have liberty in Jesus. Um, and it liberates us now. And we need to remember that we will be, but we do need to remember we will be judged. And we'll be judged by the way in which we have treated others how we uh, reach out to others. Um, we are not going to be judged prejudicially by God. And this is where I think uh, James really comes through, is that God uh, is impartial when he judges folks. He, parches, he judges people fairly, um, impartially. If we are partial in the way in which we judge and treat others based upon um, our discriminating acts because of wealth, because of position, because of power. Um, that same type of judgment and means of judging is going to be used upon with us. Um, but if we exhibit mercy as God is merciful, then that mercy will be extended to us as well. Um, so we need to work on, or what James is concerned about, is working on um, uh, keeping people out of our categories, keeping people, uh, don't be placing people as special people versus not so special people, uh, ranking people. Um, are we ready to accept someone who's got long hair or no hair? <laughs> uh, are we ready to accept people that um, don't dress as nicely every week? Uh, when they come to our, our church? Are we 
Um, how about someone who smells, who doesn't take care of themselves and has an odor? Uh, how, do we, how do we treat them? What, uh, how about, well, here's one maybe that might be even a little more difficult. How do we treat somebody who's just been released from jail? Um, when they walk in your congregation. Um, how about the person who's gay? How about the person who's got AIDS? Do, uh, do our prejudices prevent us from being um, impartial? Do our feelings about li to certain lifestyles or uh, uh, positions prevent us from tre treating each person equally? Um, how should I act then to, to others? Um, how about a blind person? Your neighbor's blind. How might we act towards a blind person? Maybe take them shopping. How about how do we how do we how do we act towards someone who's got AIDS? I remember when I was a chaplain at um, in Dallas Medical City Hospital, there was a young lady who um, um, had AIDS and she contracted AIDS because she was um, a drug user. She was attracted by needles. I got to know that that woman and love that woman. Um, she eventually died, and I was asked to do her funeral. Uh, but Patty, I loved God. She she made she made a mistake, and it costed her. It cost her life. Um, it cost her from being able to see her little boy grow up, who was nine years old at the time. But whenever I went in, in to visit her, I didn't treat her any different than a person who didn't have AIDS. Than a person, uh, I didn't treat her any differently than someone who may have been going in for heart surgery or somebody who was there for diabetic for diabetes or from other she was sick and she became a friend um, we need to treat people equally and and not prejudicially um, and, and that goes for uh, how we, we we treat the rich versus the wealthy versus the non-wealthy um, I can tell you examples of people on church boards, people in, on boards in major institutions where, that are made up of wealthy people. And because they have the bucks, they wield the power and they get their way. And it's catering to their whims. And a lot of times their whims are not good ones. Uh, this is a real problem in James's time. If we were to go to Jerusalem in the 40s and 50s, you would see a very corrupt priesthood. It was a corrupt priesthood because people were buying their, the, the priesthood. And there were situations in the priesthood in Judea and Jerusalem where those, what the wealthy priests would actually go to threshing floors where wheat was supposed to be gathered by the by the priests, uh, and that's where they got their meals. And the rich priests would send their servants and chase off the poorer priests, the priests with less money, and usurp their grain and confiscate it and take it away. The wealthy getting more wealthy and the poor becoming more poor, to the point where within the priesthood you had the haves and the have-nots. And it ended up creating a, a hostile situation that erupted in the 60s uh, that um, Jude will address uh, eventually when we get to the book of Jude. Favoritism. It existed in the time of uh, James. It exists today. And God says, showing favoritism is wrong and we ought not do it. 
The next section of, J of James, um, he focuses on uh, faith and works together. Um, and this is, has to deal with, this section has to deal with acceptance by God. Um, uh, how, does, how do we know, how, how does this acceptance of God manifest itself? And, um, um, but what James, what James is addressing here is that faith cannot be proved genuine without actions. Uh, the faith of an individual, the belief of an individual, cannot be determined as genuine without some sort of actions to demonstrate that genuine faith. So when we talk about, now, I guess before I get into this um, passage, um, I, I've got to address that white elephant that's in this room. We all know what that white elephant is, right? We have Paul who says uh, that no one is justified by faith, uh, by, uh, by works, but by faith alone. And we got James apparently saying just the opposite, that one's faith cannot be demonstrated without one's work. And so what I want to do is give an example that a friend of mine um, has used uh, on several occasions to, um, to um, kind of um, put this in perspective. So um, I'm going to do this by looking at a farming example um, and how different meanings exist for the same words uh, and different situations. So let's talk about farming. And we'll talk about an Amish, an Amish farm and a big time farmer. So an Amish farm might have three acres. A big time farmer might have 1,500 acres, but both are farms. The size of the farm doesn't matter. Both are farms. Plowing. An Amish farmer is going to plow with horse and plow one row at a time. Um, a big time farmer, he's going to have many tractors that they're able to plow many rows simultaneously. But they're both plowing. Let's talk about planting. An Amish farmer plants a few pounds of seed by hand, while the big time farmer, he's going to plant with automatic planters. Weeding. The Amish farmer is going to get out there and do it the old fashioned way. He's going to use a hoe. <laughs> What a big time farmer, what is he going to do? He's going to use a dust crop, a crop duster. Okay? So when we think about farming, and I talk about a farm, context means everything. Within the context of an Amish farmer, uh, he's going to have he's going to have three acres. He's going to plow with a, a horse. He's going to he's going to be seeding by hand and hoeing by hand. But in the context of a big farmer, he's going to be talking about 1,500 acres, he's going to have tractors, he's going to have automatic planters and a crop duster. Well, the same thing goes with Paul and James. The context determines everything. For Paul, he's combating legalism, uh, acceptance of Gentiles into the world. James, James is combating something totally different. He's combating superficial faith. Failure of church, uh, of the church to do works, to be charitable to other people. Um, in Paul, works had to do with ritual law. But works in James is about mercy. It's about charity. It's not about law. We talk about faith in Paul. It's Trusting God. Um, for James, he's appealing to faith as something that is not limited to intellectual uh, acceptance. And then Paul, concerned about declared righteous, he's talking about some judicial sense, whereas James is talking about moral sense, God's approval. 
uh, whereas Paul is more forensic in his uh, 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 thought pattern about declared righteous, James is talking about morally approved uh, based upon God. So context is everything. For Paul, he's combating legalism. For James, he's combating superficial faith and ability to, to show charity and be merciful. So, um, uh, so their context determines meaning, and I think we've got to let Paul speak for Paul and let James speak for James. And so since we're in James, we're concerned about what James is dealing with and what James is concerned about. He's just got done talking about favoritism and how it's wrong. Uh, now he's going to move into what does, what does uh, rightful living look like? What does charitable living look like? So James states a truth uh, that a true faith actually works. It manifests itself. And here's the principle stated in this exhortation in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, once again, he's speaking to Christians. What good is it if someone claims to have faith but doesn't have works? Can this kind of faith save him? Um, James just dealt with a situation in the first part of this passage of Christians who profess to love others. But when it came to practice, their personal favoritism got in the way. Their personal favoritism, their personal discrimination prevented them from being loving. It hindered them from being merciful. It blocked them from demonstrating the fact that they know God or had a faith that works. So now he raises a larger issue. He is raising a larger issue uh, concerning a person who professes to be a believer but gives absolutely no evidence. And he begins with the question uh, and questioning the reality of someone's faith who doesn't demonstrate acts of love and mercy which are uh, custom or characteristic of a Christian. 2.15, he moves into verses 15 to 17 with a concrete illustration, a concrete example. And, uh, he is, and what he's doing is he's illustrating what genuine faith is. Genuine faith must work. It has to work. It has to manifest itself in activities. So here's the illustration, verses 15 through 17. If a brother and sister is poorly clothed and lacks charity uh, and lacks daily food, <coughs> and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them what the body needs, <laughs> what good is it? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead being by itself. And this is a concrete example. Now, this, this illustration, the minute I read this verse, the first thing that comes to my mind is Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown. I love Charlie Brown. When I was a kid growing up, I, would, I, I didn't read a lot, but what I did read was comic books. Uh, Superman and uh, Spider-Man and Batman and, of course, Charlie Brown. And one of the, one of my, one of the uh, cartoons that stands out in my mind concerning Charlie Brown is um, 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 Snoopy, his dog. He's sitting in the, in the snow. And so you see this first frame, and Snoopy's just sitting there, and he's shivering. And then you see the next frame where Snoopy is sitting in the frame, shivering, and Charlie Brown and Linus is, is walking and coming up to him from this. And then the third frame, you've got Snoopy, and he's shivering, and Linus and Charlie Brown are right on top of Snoopy. And the, the uh, uh, fourth frame, Snoopy is shivering, and Charlie Brown pats Snoopy on the head, and he says, be warm and be filled. And then the <laughs> fifth frame is Charlie Brown and Linus walking away while Snoopy is still sitting in the snow, shivering. So you're in church, and a brother 
shares with you how um, he lost his job and he's um, <laughs> uh, struggling to pay his bills. And so you're listening and And as your conversation is ending, you say to him, well, brother, I'll pray for you. And then you go home. What good is that? Be warm. Be filled. Rots of ruck. Perhaps there's something else we could have done. Perhaps we could have said, are you aware that we have a benevolence fund in our church? Perhaps we might be able to help you out. Are you aware, uh, or maybe you might say, hey, would you like to come over for dinner? I think so many times we miss opportunities because we're really not, well, I think we miss opportunities because we're too busy. Uh, granted, it's a hypothetical situation that James raises here, but I think it's one that happens more times than not in our everyday situation. James is a very convicting book. I hate the book of James. I really do. There's times when I, I wish Luther had gotten its way and he wasn't allowed in the ken because it's so convicting. This is convicting. This is con not just to, you know, this, this is very convicting to me. What am I doing um, to help those that I know that need help? What are steps that I'm, now, I, we need to keep this in perspective. Uh, there are people in our pockets all the time wanting handouts and wanting money. Uh, and, and, and for some of you that are listening to this, I already know some of your hearts, some of you are already there. You are, you, you are in step with what is going on, and you do take steps. My wife does a raft of things within the community to help uh, people, and, uh, just, not just because of her job, but just, that's just the way she's, she's bent. I'm not talking to you. I think many of you do do this, but some of us, our, we just need to have a two by four wrapped around our head and, and get, get, it, get it in there. We, we need to be a little bit more sensitive to those around us that have needs. To, to demonstrate genuine faith, it has to manifest itself in the way in which we work with one another, in which we demonstrate love. Um, the two commandments... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, soul, and with all your mind. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your brothers as yourself. This is, this is acts of love. These are acts of love. Being sensitive to those around us that are in need. It's a concrete, it's a concrete illustration, though hypothetical, that needs to be attended to. Now, um, uh, I do want to make sure that faith doesn't, become a mere sentimentality. Um, it's something that needs to be done willingly. We have to, we want, we need to want to help. Um, good intentions isn't enough. Um, good sentiment isn't enough. Whether it's outwardly or inwardly, we, action is needed. Now, in verses 18 and 20, as uh, he wraps up, uh, as we're moving to wrapping up this chapter, James reasons that the true faith must work. And he, he moves into a reason, uh, beginning with verse 18. But someone will say, <coughs> in raising an objection, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show faith by my works. You believe God is one? Well, good. Even the demons believe that and tremble with fear. But would you like evidence, you empty person, that faith without works is useless? 
So now he's moving into the reasons that true faith must work. <clears throat> and he sets up what we call a, a straw man. Um, a straw man asserts that faith and works are separate. We have faith and we have works, and the two are separated and aren't to be considered equal. Uh, however, faith and works can't be separated. Uh, faith and works would be like taking a, a, a coin, uh, uh, and on the one side, there's a head, and on the other side, there's the tails. It's the same coin. It's the flip side of the same coin. Uh, you can't have a coin with, both, with, with heads with no tails, and you can't have a coin with tail with no head. It's not a coin. It's not a nickel. So faith and works can't be separated in much the same way as a, a nickel would have a head and a tail, or a penny might have a head and a tail or a back. They're the same coin. They're one and the same. They can't be separated. Secondly, James boldly challenges someone who would state that they can. I would challenge you about the coin. Show me a coin that has no back to it. It only consists of a head. It's not a coin. It, no salesperson will take your nickel if it doesn't have both sides of the coin. Genuine faith cannot be proved apart from action. Faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. So the straw man asserts that faith is uh, uh, another straw man that comes up in this passage is that straw man asserts that faith is generally just all cognitive. It's all in the head. But faith is not merely mental. Um, and he, he challenges uh, this idea uh, first by saying, you do well to have correct theology. That's a, that's a good point. You need to be correct in your theological thinking. Think correctly theologically. And so he cites the Shema. You know, so let's just Jesus cites it several times a day. They attach merit to it, and they being recited to it. If you prolong the word one, uh, word one, the word one, then your life would also be prolonged. Uh, so they have this the idea about Shema and how important that is, and then, but even demons have the correct theology about God. Um, however, it's not. It doesn't save them. Reciting the Shema doesn't save the Jew. Reciting the Shema doesn't, uh, and demons believing that God exists doesn't uh, uh, prove they're saved. It doesn't affect them at all. Just, just, so you know, just, so, just because you have correct theology doesn't mean you're on target. I remember uh, Boltman. I love I love reading Boltmann in Johannine letters. I mean, what a scholar. Um, able to take that text, uh, work with the Greek text, put it within a historical context, and, and just the nuggets that you can glean from it. You know, uh, and, he, and he did have a lot of uh, good theology. But then he had some bad theology. No resurrection. There is no resurrection. And he lived, he lived like there was no resurrection. Um, uh, it's good to have theology, but theology should affect the way you live. He believed there was no resurrection and lived as though there was no resurrection. We believe there is a God and that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are members of the kingdom. That should affect the way we live. Correct theology, however, in just believing that Jesus is Messiah and we are kingdom saints does not equate genuine faith. We should live as kingdom saints. So he argues in verses 21 to 25 that true faith must work. True faith must work. Let's look at 21 to 25 as we wrap this up. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? 
you see that his faith was working together with his works, and his faith was perfected by works. And that scripture was fulfilled that says, Now Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called God's friend. That's the first example. We'll come back to the second in a minute. Um, here in uh, this case, we're talking in 21 to 25, he's talking about Abraham. Um, he's talking about, and the word, the solution to this problem lies in the meaning of justification. Uh, this word also means to declare righteous, but Abraham was declared righteous more than once. Um, it was credited to him as righteous because he believed God. The first scriptural statement of his justification is usually felt to identify his new birth, uh, to use the New Testament term. But if, about 50 years later, James says Abraham was justified a second time. And in view of the fact that scripture consistently teaches that believers who are once justified never lose their righteousness, righteous standing with God, and therefore do not need to be saved again, this sub subject sub subsequent justification evidently refers to a subsequent declaration of righteousness. James says his works made that declaration. They gave testimony to his faith. So on the one hand, God declares him just enough because he believes, but later on, the sacrifice and this, this uh, sacrifice of uh, Isaac and altar was works that, or was faith that worked. It evidenced what he believed. What he believed affected how he lived. And then how he lived reflected what it was that he believed. And even though we, we, we claim that Paul uh, does not have this same type of philosophy, when you look at his writings, oftentimes, uh, particularly in Ephesians and Colossians, he'll have a, a dialogue, or even in Romans, he'll have a dialogue where he's dealing with theological truth but the second half of the book, you know, all those letters, there's, a, there's therefore, and then he deals with, in light of what you know and what I've told you up here, this is the way you ought to live. Paul also believed that genuine faith manifested itself in real action. Faith that worked. And I frequently talk about how Paul says what you believe about God affects how you live and how you live reflects what it is that you believe. James is saying the same thing. Abraham believed God. He was credited as being righteous, but he manifested that righteousness. He manifested his faith in the manner in which he willingly uh, took steps to sacrifice Isaac and believed that God would intervene. The second example um, is uh, seen in verse 25. And similarly, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messenger and sent them out by another way? So here we have um, Rahab being used as an example. And um, she is seen as someone who uh, um, puts this, uh, if you remember the story with, of Rahab, um, she is a, um, a woman of ill repute in Jericho who takes in spies, and she believes in the God of these spies. And she demonstrates her belief when they leave, and she, she's told to put a, um, a uh, red kerchief of some sort out her window. Um, if she didn't believe that the God, the, spy, the God of the spies was able to rescue her, would she not or would she have um, um, not put that thing out, that, that red cloth? She believed and it affected how she responded to that request. The verse closes, um, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Um, he's making a direct, 
correlation that if we are without works, then our faith is meaningless. It's, um, it's dead. Um, he argues in, in verses 21 to 25 that faith is costly. Um, um, and it must rewrite our lives. It must affect the way we live. Um, without, with Abraham, faith and works were inseparable. With Rahab, um, she made her decision based upon faith. Um, faith alone justifies, but faith which justifies is not alone. It's always accompanied by works. So no matter who we are, whether we're a patriarch or a prostitute, uh, the acid test uh, is always faith that works. Action is the product of life. Um, so Paul and James don't contradict themselves, each other. Uh, they are speaking to different crowds from different perspective. Um, and the question I have, you know, as we think our way through this, uh, I think there's, there's two things that need to, to, to be discussed as we think about uh, what we have um, as this chapter 2 unfolds. The first part of this chapter talks about showing favoritism. And there, showing favoritism is an act that reveals bad faith, reveals, reveals improper actions. Showing favoritism is wrong. Being discriminatory is wrong. Then we have this uh, second part that talks about and focuses attention on uh, faith that works um, and that works together. Um, faith cannot be proved as genuine without actions. but they've got to be right actions. Showing favoritism are wrong actions. Being merciful, compassionate, loving, they are right actions. And I think James separates the two, showing how Christians can demonstrate wrong actions that are quite sinful, and then how Christians can neglect doing any actions which are just as sinful. We need to be more uh, proactive in the actions that we choose to do that are loving and merciful towards one another. So that's chapter 2 of James. I have a few minutes and what I'd like to do is uh, take this time because I knew that this was going to be a rel relatively uh, quick chapter uh, to walk through um, is to uh, suggest a few books that might be helpful as you do some further study because Naturally, this video is going to be very um, uh, to, point, to the point. There's a lot more that can be discussed in, in, in both these chapters, chapters 1 and 2, and the subsequent chapters that we're about to study. So let me recommend a few books that might be helpful in further study. One uh, is the, uh, a new international Greek commentary, new Greek, new, the Greek Testament commentary, commentary on James by, David, uh, by Peter Davids. It is an Excellent commentary, highly recommended. Now, the kicker is that um, it is a uh, Greek. It's going to be interacting with the Greek text. If you don't have Greek background, this, this could be a, a little bit above your head. Uh, but you do have, if you do have Greek background, this can be extremely helpful. Another work uh, that is extremely helpful that, uh, that I really enjoy is Dan McCart McCartney on James. This is in the Baker Exegetical Commentary series. Now, he too interacts with the Greek text, but it's much more user-friendly, um, a lot uh, easier to read, um, more along the lines of an expositional work. I, when I think about commentaries, I tend to classify them in one of three ways, critical, expositional, and devotional. Um, and critical commentaries are going to be very Greek-oriented uh, and um, uh, technical, expositional, they're going to work with the text, but they are um, going to, they're going to major on the majors, they're not going to get overly bogged down, and, devo and then devotional 
uh, commentaries are like Warren Wearsby or John MacArthur. They're, they're sermons that have been converted into books. They're more devotional. Um, uh, Dan McCartney's work is as a cross between a critical and an expositional. It, it kind of a, it was a combination of two, but tends to lean more to being more expositional. So this, is a, this would be a, an excellent work uh, to go to. Then, for those of you who, who are into preaching and teaching the text, I uh, highly recommend Don uh, Sanukian's work, Invitation to James, Persevering Through Trials to Win the Crown. Um, excellent work, and he's going to be focusing on how you can communicate this text to others. Finally, there's uh, Preaching James by William Baker and Thomas uh, Ellsworth. Um, this is out of Chalice Press. Uh, again, another good work uh, to, to approach and use if you're thinking about preaching and teaching James. Now, there's, there's a lot of commentaries out there. And um, just as a, a, uh, an FYI, in the back of this book uh, that I wrote on interpreting the general letters, chapter 8 is a resource uh, of material, uh, selected sources uh, for... Um, uh, for studying the general letters. And in the back, I have a, a guide for choosing commentaries. And it lists commentaries by series. Uh, uh, their, their stated uh, purpose and the description for the letters. And then the list of the books and those who wrote those commentaries. So this would be uh, an added um, plus uh, to you uh, for looking for commentaries if you want to look at others that exist. These are some of the ones I recommend, but there are others uh, noted in this book. Well, until next time, when we look at chapter three, uh, I trust you're gonna have a great day. Bye. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number five, James chapter two, Prejudice and Genuine Faith.